Our next uh, spokes, spoke speaker is Mr. Fayez Murshid Kazi, Counselor of the Repu Permanent Mission of Bangladesh to the United Nations. Sorry about that. Could you find uh, the PowerPoint presentation? Or Good. Um, let me start since we have uh, already uh, perhaps lost a bit of time. Uh, right from the third world here, um, I'm representing uh, Bangladesh. Uh, I was wondering as to where I exactly fit or Bangladesh fits uh, in this conference. I see the title U.S.-China Cooperation on the Belt and Road Initiative and Corresponding Ideas. I guess that's where uh, we would perhaps fit in, the corresponding ideas. So thanks to the Schiller Institute uh, for inviting us. Uh, I'm very much a generalist and has no expertise on infrastructure or connectivity, but uh, it's definitely a pleasure to be able to uh, say a few words as to how we are looking at connectivity from Bangladesh's point of view. In China, there is a saying that a rising tide uh, raises all the boats. And as a close neighboring country, of course, we have been trying to see how we can leverage or tap into the phenomenal Chinese economic rise and try to use that to our advantage to promote our own economic growth and structural transformation. So in that context, maybe, uh, yes, it's working. Thank you very much. Uh, just to help you locate where Bangladesh is, um, as you can see, it's kind of a very small country uh, squeezed in between India and China uh, to some extent. On uh, the um, eastern side, we have another big region the Southeast Asian region, which is commonly known as ASEAN. So uh, we are kind of in between the three major economic powerhouses of the world at the moment. And that we believe gives us a massive uh, geostrategic advantage. And the challenge is of course, to see how we can make use of that in the context of the various uh, global trends, the mega trends that we are currently witnessing. It's obvious that the world is passing through a, a certain uncertain and tumultuous time. Uh, we have uh, talked a lot about the conflict and security and fragility and the growing conflict between state and non-state actors. Of course, the uh, rise in international terrorism and violent extremism, no country is immune from that. And of course, there is kind of a paradigm shift which is happening in the nature of power and of course the global balance of power as we had known it in the last century. Uh, so in the midst of all that what's uh, kind of noticeable is that the center of global economic power is gradually shifting towards the Asia Pacific and by many estimates by 2050 Asia Pacific region would probably account for half of the world's economic output. Just to share some statistics, two thirds of the world population would be living in Asia Pacific, that would be 4.3 billion again by 2050. One fourth of global GDP, uh, and, uh, and it would amount to uh, $3.8 trillion uh, economy. And of course, the top three trading nations of the world uh, would be again in the Asia Pacific. So in general, what we are witnessing is that the Asia Pacific is exerting a gravitational pull and uh, China is very much at the heart of it or at the center of it. Now, uh, again, uh, this may sound like a bit of um, drum beating about ourselves, but uh, we, of course, uh, see uh, or look at Bangladesh as kind of an emerging important player in the Asia Pacific context. And as we try to show, uh, uh, not least because of our geostrategic location, 
uh, our demographic trend by many estimates again by 2035 or till 2035 we would continue to enjoy a demographic dividend i should have perhaps said that uh, although we are a small low-lying delta our population size is already pretty big 160 million people uh, inhabiting a land area which is kind of near about the size of Wisconsin, I guess. Uh, so uh, that perhaps gives you some idea about uh, the challenges that we have. But at the same time, we look at this demography or this population as a potential as asset. And uh, that's how perhaps the international world is also looking at us as a potential large market uh, with uh, growing development potentials. And in terms of our engagement in international politics, uh, we often say that even as a small country, we have always been trying to uh, pack our punch above our weight. Uh, if you uh, go to the United Nations, for example, at least people would be able to vouch for it, uh, Bangladesh's contributions to uh, multilateral affairs and so forth. Just to give an example, uh, we are one of the biggest contributors to UN peacekeeping operations at the moment. Uh, we are also uh, a major development player in the sense that our performance with the Millennium Development Goals is something that the UN loves to project, and we have also taken a lead in implementing the Sustainable Development Goals. Again, to move on, uh, just to set the context, uh, just to give you an idea about uh, our map and how we are located, and perhaps uh, that allows us to shift to the idea of connectivity that we are actually discussing here. Of course, uh, these are again uh, things that must have been discussed a number of times. Uh, we see connectivity as a cornerstone of regional economic cooperation and integration. And again, as you could see, as a small country squeezed between some very uh, major international or regional powers, uh, we do understand that regional cooperation and integration would be the key to unlock, unlock any development potential that we may have. So for us, it's absolutely a sine qua non. And uh, we also agree that improved connectivity along with trade facilitation can significantly enhance regional trade by reducing transportation time and trade costs. We are shifting uh, from being an agrarian economy to manufacturing. You must have heard about our somewhat infamous ready-made garments industry, but there are also other uh, manufacturing sectors which are thriving. And the uh, objective is obviously to move towards more of a service-based, service-oriented economy. And for all that to happen, obviously, connectivity would again play a critical role. So for us, connectivity contributes to re reducing poverty and achieving a more balanced and inclusive uh, growth across regions. Again, to set things in perspective, when Bangladesh became independent in 1971, our uh, poverty rate, national poverty rate, was something around 80%. Now, over the last 45 years, it has come down to something like 22%, which is still like almost one quarter of the population below the poverty line. Extreme poverty still accounts for 7 to 8%, and that is kind of the priority that we have identified that we would have to tackle going forwards. But this next leg of challenges that we have uh, it would be very much contingent upon how much we are able to uh, mainstream our economy into the regional economic uh, activities that's going around. Uh, why should connectivity matter globally and, and regionally? Of course, again, uh, just to share some uh, statistics. I mean, as we know, most connected countries can expect to increase GDP growth rates up to 40% uh, more than the least connected countries. And if we look at uh, some of the um, most connected countries list, of course, uh, there is not much reason for being despondent about the US situation. You can see from the connectedness index, uh, the US still ranks pretty high in the list, which is kind of third, although it's a bit dated from 2012, but the situation should not have altered to a great extent. But uh, there are some bright examples like India and Brazil, which had uh, made these leapfrogs in terms of how they became kind of mainstreamed 
into the global flow of uh, connectivity and services. And those are the kind of models that uh, set the precedent for growing, uh, transforming countries like Bangladesh. And uh, it does make a lot of sense for the private sector as well. Global flows provide companies with new ways to put their assets to productive use. And again, uh, the whole rational uh, global interconnectedness is definitely rewriting the rules of business as we know them and interstate relations. Now, we do not see connectivity only in terms of uh, physical connectivity or infrastructure, which is, of course, critical. But as our uh, colleagues have been talking about trade and transport connectivity, uh, production and distribution network, energy connectivity, uh, the human mobility, the whole issue of population dynamics, uh, nurturing of knowledge-based society, ICT advancements, and people-to-people -people exchanges. These are all part of the whole uh, notion of connectivity that uh, we are currently envisaging. Uh, just a quote from our Prime Minister as she was speaking at a, a regional conference in 2014, where she said physical connectivity is important in ensuring overall peace, progress, and stability across South Asia. So uh, connectivity has this additional dimension as well. It's not just a vehicle for economic development, but we think it can also foster peace, progress, and st uh, stability. And she's also talking about the wider connotation of connectivity that uh, we kind of uh, try to uh, emphasize on. And we believe in connecting ideas, knowledge, technology, culture, people, rage, role, air, movement of goods, services, and investment. Uh, now, moving on to uh, the subject of, of this conference and how we actually uh, fare uh, in the context of the Chinese initiative for the uh, One Belt, One Road initiative and also the Maritime Silk Road of the 21st century. Of course, uh, the facts are pretty well known and uh, it's an exciting grand initiative which would be linking up Central Asia, South Asia, Southeast Asia, and Africa, bringing Pan-Asian and Eurasian regional cooperation to a whole new level. And if you would uh, see some of the underlying purposes of this initiative are to promote understanding and trust among the corridor countries, advancing Asia's economic integration, and again, contributing to peace, stability, and common development. So these are very much in sync with our national priorities as to how we look at connectivity as a potential tool for fostering both peace and development in the region. Uh, this is uh, just a map to show how this grand vision is probably going to work out, but uh, just a skeletal representation. Again, uh, talking about some of the uh, key underlying uh, motivations and objectives. Uh, if you look at it, there are these notions of policy coherence, facilitating regional and economic and trade cooperation, improving road connectivity, uh, strengthening people-to-people -people exchanges, and of course, financing for development. And it's a great news for the entire region that China has already set aside $1.6 billion uh, 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 for a fund to implement this whole initiative. Now, uh, the particular um, Part of the initiative that actually relates to Bangladesh is what we uh, generally call the Bangladesh, China, India, Myanmar Economic Corridor. Uh, the acronym is BCIMEC. And as you can see, uh, it kind of starts from Kunming in South China. I think our colleague from Chiaotong University was just showing you the kind of transportation network China has built along its, along its eastern coast and also increasingly along its uh, southern part. But if you look at the map, the uh, southern provinces in China, particularly Yunnan and Sichuan, they are kind of landlocked. They do not really have a direct access to the sea, an advantage with the eastern provinces in China enjoy. So it's kind of very much to the interest of these southern provinces to find a route or access to the sea through countries in South and Southeast Asia. And for that, countries like Myanmar or Burma, Bangladesh, and of course, India, we can kind of provide those gateways uh, to these, those parts of, of China. 
So that uh, particular economic corridor starts off in Kunming, which is the capital of the Yunnan province, and then moves to Myanmar. I'm sorry that you cannot see some of the names, but one of the names at the middle to kind of uh, uh, take note of is Mandalay. And then it traverses Mandalay and goes to India, actually, on our eastern side. And from India, then it enters into Bangladesh. It goes to our capital and then again uh, gets out through this city called Jasore in Bangladesh and enters into India and connects uh, Kolkata, which is again the capital of West Bengal in India. So uh, BCIM, of course, the Chinese have been talking about this for quite some time, in fact, uh, since 1999. Uh, and we have been engaged in these discussions, but um, because of certain regional political dynamics, it didn't quite get traction until uh, 2013 when it kind of got elevated to a track one initiative. And uh, then uh, the first work that had been launched was a joint study group uh, that had undertaken some research to see how we can harmonize the standards of infrastructure and connectivity across these uh, various countries. Again, as our colleague was showing, I mean, China has made some phenomenal strides in terms of its infrastructure, but uh, other countries which are involved, like Bangladesh and Myanmar, we would definitely have a long way to go to match that standard in terms of harmonization of infrastructure and so forth. Uh, but if you look at the areas of cooperation again, uh, it goes beyond just physical connectivity, of course, giving emphasis on trade in goods, services, finance and investment, but also quite importantly talking about environmentally sustainable development. Moving on uh, quickly, uh, I mean, we have also some other additional initiatives. Uh, one ex particular example from uh, Japan, uh, which is an island uh, that they have now started building a massive infrastructure project around. The whole idea is actually uh, to kind of transform it into a potential uh, trading hub. Uh, not just for Bangladesh, but for the uh, greater region. And there would be a supercritical coal-fired coal power project and also a deep sea port and also uh, electricity generation capacity to the amount of 1,200 uh, megawatts. I won't go into the details. This is how this, this whole project would be looking at, uh, look, I mean, uh, uh, including the coal yard and the deep sea port and, and so forth. Uh, there are also certain regional connectivity initiatives. Uh, there are two regional organizations that we are part of. One is the South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation, SARC, and the other one is a regional initiative around the Bay of Bengal, which is called Binstec. They are also uh, doing some constructive work in terms of uh, multimodal uh, transportation and so forth. Again, one particular project which has gained some traction is what we call up there, the Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, and Nepal uh, Economic Corridor, which is, uh, again, the acronym is BBIN. Uh, just to give an idea about what we are trying to do in, in South Asia and, and in the sub-regional context, uh, these are different ways we are trying to kind of link these various countries in the region, which unfortunately had been uh, disconnected uh, since perhaps the colonial times. So the ancient linkages or connectivity that we had in the region, we are trying to kind of revive them. And it's not again just in the area of physical connectivity, but also in terms of coastal shipping, in terms of energy connectivity and uh, air connectivity as well. Uh, again, some of the maps, just to give an example, the Kathmandu Dhaka, which Kathmandu is the capital of Nepal. Uh, the road is uh, 1,152 kilometers. Thimphu Dhaka between Bhutan and Bangladesh, 630 kilometers. And Kolkata Agartala between two parts of India, between its western and eastern part, 530 kilometers. So these are not like long stretch of roads, but um, these are the connectivity gaps that we definitely do need to kind of plug in. I won't go into the details about BBIN, but uh, the Asian Development Bank has come forward with uh, pledges of financing and they have uh, 
again, put aside $8 billion for five years between 2016 and 2020 to kind of unleash some of these projects uh, concerning the BBI uh, initiative. Coastal shipping is something that I have talked about. Uh, this is again kind of uh, moving into the broader region. I mean, there are also other initiatives like the East-West Economy Corridor, which traverses uh, parts of Southeast Asia. As you can see, countries like Myanmar, Thailand, and Vietnam, uh, they're being connected. And when we were talking about BCIM, BCIM does have the potential to be connected to the East-West Corridor as well. So this is uh, the many ways that the whole region is kind of getting uh, connected. Other uh, initiatives like India, Myanmar, Thailand, trilateral highway. Um, and again, since we were talking about energy connectivity, uh, there is also some interesting work that's going on over there. And again, from, for a growing economy like ours, there is a huge energy demand, which we cannot cater, uh, cater to on our own. So obviously we would have to tap into the resources which are available in the neighborhood including from Myanmar, Nepal, and Bhutan in terms of their uh, coal power, their hydroelectricity, and other potentials that are available. Um, uh, so finally, I mean, again, in terms of financing all these projects, uh, you have heard a lot about the BRICS Development Bank, the Contingency Reserve Arrangement, and the Asian Infrastructure Bank. Um, again, just to circle back to the uh, Asia-Pacific region, uh, what is kind of interesting is to see that between 1500 and 1800, the world's center of power moved from uh, Asia-Pacific to the Mediterranean Basin and to Europe, and by the 19th century, by the end of 19th century to North America. But uh, we think that we are now shifting that uh, historical trend, moving back to Asia, as, as we had talked about some of the scenarios by uh, 2050. And um, these are, again, uh, some of the facts concerning, of course, China. By 2050, it's supposed to be the largest economy, and India will be a, a close third, almost on par with the USA. And this would be followed by uh, some other big powers, including some Asian uh, countries like Indonesia, for example. So uh, just to wrap up how we see, uh, again, Bangladesh faring, I mean, we, of course, consider the whole issue of connectivity as a strategic opportunity. And we believe that it gives us a win-win opportunity and we should not kind of be held hostage to some zero-sum geographical games that had actually frustrated some of these uh, linkages and initiatives so far. And of course, uh, diplomatically, it's critical for us that we try to navigate through our relations with these different uh, countries to get the maximum benefit for the development of our people. So uh, with that note on strategic partnership, thank you very much.